It's great to see you all uh, uh, today. Um, it's a beautiful day in Berkeley, and um, and another great day for for more uh, smart parking. I'd like to uh, once again thank our sponsors, uh, especially our sponsor for last night, um, Xerox and uh, Park, that hosted our reception. It was a great reception. So. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna jump back in uh, right away this morning. We've got a couple of uh, sponsor spotlights, and then um, we'll get into our first session of the morning. Um, we'll go again until about three thirty. After lunch, we've got a session that really focuses. It's a um, a virtual tour of S of SF Park. So uh, make sure you stick around for that, and um, and we'll get going. So first, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, re-invite Amir Sadati, uh, up the Vice President for Intelligent Transportation Systems for the IPS Group, and he's going to talk a little bit about about what they do. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Is it okay if I minimize this and? Uh, yeah, it is fine. There you go. Okay. <laughs> it should be fine. I, I didn't close it. I promise. I just, I just minimized it. Um. Good morning. Thank you. Um, IPS is proud to be a sponsor here, and it was great to see uh, many of you yesterday, and it's great to see all of you today. we got a, another great panel here. Um, IPS has just been a, a base, California-based company, uh, 15 years in the business of uh, manufacturing engineering. Uh, they started in the communications business with the uh, payphones uh, systems, and they were able to use that technology in R&D and, and make a, a, a very solid parking meter that takes uh, credit card payments in a single space world where in many, many years it was the only way to do that was through pay stations and kiosks. They're best known for the uh, single space meters. Why does IPS work? It's proven reliability. It has the greatest convenience to the public uh, in the form of everybody's used to that parking meter being right outside your car. Uh, it has all the smart features that municipalities and cities want. Again, in, in a time about 10 to 12 years ago, it was only those kiosks that were able to uh, give you those things. But uh, all of that is, is featured in these new single space meters that work everywhere. Um, and again, IPS has a proven product uh, record. Thank you. Um, what does this result in? Many, many cities and many of the customers currently seen a huge increase in revenues, anywhere from 20% to 50%. And it's been... Um, it's been great for, for them, especially in these tough economic times. Improved operational efficiencies and accountabilities. I'm going to talk fast because I know we're late, and I want to show you a couple quick uh, two-minute videos. Again, the company has been very successful, over um, 100,000 cities across USA and Canada, more than 100,000 meters deployed and growing. And, and I think this is a, a, you know, the, the tool of it. IPS started with perhaps the, the meter, but now they're providing a whole solution of what we call a, a toolbox kit. Uh, vehicle sensors, smart collection systems, integrating with third parties, um, and all of that is able um, to work with the uh, very easy user interface program. Um, here's a couple of pictures of our uh, different uh, meters, uh, which there's actually the Mark V, which is the latest meters out there. Lori Keller is here. She'll be happy to show you. Uh, but basically, this new generation takes the NFC, the Near Field Communication, the contactless uh, forms of payment, much better efficiency in the battery use, and bigger screen. Uh, there's a lot of great companies here, uh, sensor companies. IPS actually has a sensor uh, that is, uh, works wirelessly with the meter. Uh, there's no mesh network needed, and therefore it's much, much less costly. It's about one-third of the cost. Uh, and also there's different sensing technologies, ultrasound, magnometers, and, and radar as well. Uh, just a quick picture of uh, the cache system. They're using the sensors, again, to wirelessly use and find out where the, the coins are going and how that coin, uh, being able to account for all that money, especially cities with auditing. That's a, that's a big, um, important feature for them. Uh, a really powerful data management system, and I'm going to show you the video why it's so powerful. Um, and also, IPS has won a lot of awards. Um, and they also have a humanitarian part of the company where they provide their meters as a way for cities to capture revenues for different charity. People, instead of uh, paying money to panhandlers or, or people that are asking for money, they put these different meters where you can pay your credit card or use that for charity purposes. Uh, and now I'd like to 
just quickly um, give you a preface. This is true story in Los Angeles where some guy gets a ticket, and for all of you managing your programs, it's important to know social media is out there. He gets a ticket, gets his iPhone. I'm going to blast you. Why are you giving me a ticket? Um, it's he said, she said, and I'm just going to let you see it. And it's about, a, and hopefully I was able to get rid of the commercial. So let's see if we can... Uh, Actually, I just have one uh, one-minute video after that that tells you what happened after. Um. It's just the power of data, what it can do, and, and I assure you in the city with um, issues two, two and a half million tickets, it was very important to have the data to support what you're doing a good job. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, one, one more quick um, sponsor spotlight, and uh, William DeRuiter uh, from Fleur um, Intelligent Transportation Systems. William? Here? Okay. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Michael, actually. Oh. Uh, William is my colleague. Oh, Michael, sorry. Um, so I'm with the Belgian headquarters of Traficon, so I'm sorry for uh, my accent. <laughs> um, yep, 
there it is if you can press this one thank you very much so Trafficon is a, a technology driven company and basically we can, we can rely on more than 30 years of experience in ITS intelligent transportation we have more than 100,000 uh, intelligent cameras installed uh, for vehicle detection, for urban intersection control, highway monitoring, automatic incident detection, even pedestrian detection, uh, and many more uh, applications. Now, um, in December 2012, last year, uh, we were acquired by Fleur Systems. I'm going to read this from my notes. Uh, so Fleur Systems is, a, is the world leader in the design, manufacture, and marketing of sensor systems. They enhance perception and awareness. The company's thermal imaging systems are used for a vi wide variety of thermographic and security applications, including airborne, ground-based surveillance, search and rescue navigation, transportation safety, border maritime patrol, R&D, and manufacturing process control. Okay, that's a whole lot of applications for one company. Well, Traficon is going to be the Fleur Intelligent Transportation's division. So um, we all know ITS, it's not only about uh, what's happening on the road, it's also what's happening next to the road, on the parking lots, on the parking garages, on street parking. So what we see is that the parking industry is going through an era of digitalization because the digital data can be combined with other data to serve greater purposes. For instance, why, for instance I'm going to give a, a, an example of how we got first introduced to parking applications was basically when one of our customers, uh, a city, uh, who was using our traffic cams to monitor the congestion of their entry roads to the main city, and they saw a lot of congestions at certain times of the day. And they wanted to find out where these people come from. So we also added license plate recognition cameras, and we monitored that all these people that come down to the city were actually not people that live in the city, but were people that came down to visit, for, for instance, for shopping. So the city wanted to guide these visitors to the nearby uh, parking lots and they wanted to combine uh, the parking data with the congestion data. So they wanted to uh, send the people to the parking lots through the roads that were least congested and to the parking lots that had the most available places. So they also started using traffic cams at their parking lots. So basically we started counting vehicles at a parking lot whereas we were counting vehicles at an intersection. So for us, in fact, this is a, a different environment. It's a different, uh, different locations, different needs from the parking industry. So we started, as all other technologies also started adapting their technology. So we saw inductive loops evolving to wireless sensors. There are a lot of manufacturers over here. So we also evolved from, from, from smart cameras detecting moving vehicles. We started detecting stopped vehicles, uh, in, in fact, parked vehicles at parking lots. So our products basically evolved uh, to that. And with a little bit of help of FLIR as well, we can benefit from thermal imaging uh, to get to that high accuracy level that is needed for counting vehicles and detection vehicles at parking lots. And I want to show uh, one video uh, before I end my presentation um, of a system we did in Europe for smart truck parking. So we had a nice presentation yesterday on smart truck parking and this has been going on in Europe as well. Sorry for the So in Europe, um, the occupancy at parking lots are saturated for trucks. And not only saturated, but, but also during certain times of the day. And truck drivers need to be notified of where they can park uh, and, and in what parking lots they can drive because they have to limit their driving, dis driving time up to a certain amount of time. So. We started developing a system that could detect the trucks uh, at the parking lots and we, we used video detection to do that because the customers w were asking for video detection because they wanted to use the video as video surveillance because the video surveillance system could upgrade their parking 
level or class to a secure parking. And that's basically why, um, why I'm here as well, because we would like to present this technology in the United States as well and get this product going. So that's my presentation, and I would like to hand over to Thank Scott. You. Thank you, Michael. All right, so for those of you, Carol, who are concerned about time, we have plenty of time. We've built, we've built, we've built time into, into the schedule, and you're not going to be shortchanged. So don't, I want to make sure that you guys have, have an opportunity to, 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 to have your panel. So don't, don't worry. Um, we will, we've got a lot of time at lunch that we can squeeze if we need to so that we can all get out of here uh, on time. So we're now going to go into our next panel. This is, we're going to do this town hall style, particularly because we've got one participant who's on Skype up there at some point um, and will be participating. And so if you, when you have questions, we're going to need, need for you to walk down to the front uh, where the microphones are and, and speak into the microphones. Um, so our first panel, and we've, we've heard a lot about um, SF Park over the, over the last day. It seems, I was going to say a couple of days. It seems like that sometimes. But uh, over the last day, um, it's the largest of its kind in da dynamically managed parking supply to encourage turnover as well as modal shifts and congestion reduction. Um, and we've got a great panel here that will be chaired um, by uh, Carol Kuster, uh, who's a senior program co coordinator at MTC. Um, and has been very involved in this. And so this is, an, again, an example, to, an opportunity to l listen about or to learn about what have we learned, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and, and what can we take uh, into different communities. So, Carol? Thanks. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, I am actually concerned about the time because I, I think that this SF Park presentation is really important for all of you in the audience to have the benefit of learning from. So, And we do have a very... Uh, distinguished panel of speakers here this morning. Um, I'll introduce them in a moment, but first a couple of logistics. We did agree as a panel to have the presenters go through and give their presentations, um, one right after another, and to hold uh, questions and answers to the end. Um, we really want to do that so that we can foster a lot of discussion back and forth about the material that's presented. Um, so please hold your questions to the end. Um, let's see, another point of clarification, let's see, I, I'm Carol Kuster. I work for the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the Bay Area Toll Authority. Um, we're responsible for planning and funding transportation in the San Francisco Bay Area. So that includes the nine counties around San Francisco. And the reason why I'm here today is that we have followed the SF Park project very, very closely. We care about mobility, we care about congestion, and therefore we are thrilled to have the SF Park as a pilot program really cutting edge, um, setting the standard we hope nationally and also locally for other projects to follow. So we've been um, involved with Jay and his work from the get-go and also very concerned about a key issue that was highlighted I think in yesterday's discussion about the LA project which is um, I think it's exciting to see Dr. Shoup's theories applied on the street here in San Francisco but from an economist's viewpoint what each patron needs in order to make perfect decisions is perfect information and so um, I'm real interested to have the folks here today talk to us about their real-life lessons learned in not only getting the technology to work, fighting the political battles and getting the policies in place, getting the public acceptance to work, but also providing the tools and promoting the, promoting the availability of the information so that people can really make uh, their good decisions based on the best available information. So with that, our panel includes today... Um, Jay Primus, who is the program director and the head of the SF Park program at the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Authority. So he is the practitioner on the street leading this all up, and he's going to kick off the panel. We also then have Thomas Valley from Street Smart to talk about the very important technological component of delivering this project. Uh, then we have Dan Chapman, a researcher here at Cal's very own Department of City and Regional Planning, to talk about um, the analysis and research and lessons learned from an academic perspective. And then at the very end, we're going to have Alan Greenberg from the Federal Highway Administration um, come to give us some of his thoughts from a federal perspective uh, via Skype. 
So with that, I will uh, introduce, I think he needs no introduction, Jay Premis, featured in many a New York Times article about this groundbreaking uh, San Francisco project. Jay has uh, been the original project manager for SF Park at SFMTA since 2007. And prior to that, he did some work with Nelson Nygaard, a consulting firm here in the Bay Area. So please give a warm welcome to Jay Primus. Thanks. All right, thank you, and uh, good morning. I'm going to jump right in and talk fast and try to leave as much time for the interesting part, which is the discussion with all of you after we get through our presentations. Being at a uh, parking symposium, is there a way to make this full screen? Uh, that'll work. So, you know, being at a parking symposium in California, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with SF Park, uh, but just in case, I'm going to give a 90-second overview of, of what it is. Uh, first, I work at the MTA, uh, which is the agency in San Francisco that manages transportation, and that includes parking, both on-street, all on-street parking in San Francisco, as well as 20 lots and 20 garages. And at some point, uh, we realized, uh, like a, a, lo a lot of people, that parking is a really powerful tool to achieve our goals, not just a way to balance our budgets. And that was the idea behind SF Park, trying to modernize how we approach parking and moving from how we'd manage parking for 70 years, which emphasized very short time limits uh, to achieve turnover goals, to focus on availability, using better information, real-time information, and demand-responsive pricing to achieve availability goals. In other words, to make it easy for a driver, to, most of the time, to find a parking space quickly and get, mat, get off the road as quickly as possible. And all of that to re reduce circling, reduce double parking, and achieve from those uh, a lot of the benefits uh, that we're hoping to see, whether improving customer service, not having people not waste um, a small portion of their life circling around looking for parking, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving um, transit speed and reliability, I think something that is subtle uh, but really important, rarely what we do in parking management is a matter of life and death, but reducing circling is a big deal. Um, if, we, if people aren't circling around as distracted drivers for 10 minutes on a street like this, um, they are far less likely to hit a pedestrian or a cyclist, and that really matters. And these pilots are covering about 25% of the city uh, with, with generous federal funding. Uh, in the neighborhoods you see here, and have in, in, are running their course, uh, ending the two-year pilot, um, coming up formally uh, this summer. And this is this is the general timeline. Uh, funding in hand in, in 2009, we really launched in April 2011 with real-time information. Did our first rate changes in the summer of 2011, and are gearing up for the after data collection and and really formal rigorous evaluation this summer and fall. And we're, as we're getting to the end of this, I know a lot of you have heard about SF Park and have been hearing about it at this point for years. Uh, everyone wants to know, how is it working? You know, what's, what's going on? I think there's a lot of rumor. Um, we, we don't know for sure and are really going to wait for a, a patient, careful, rigorous evaluation. We are very prepared uh, with the data collection um, to do that kind of analysis. Uh, the, Alan is heading up a federal team that will do an independent evaluation, and several academic folks will be doing that as well. But as far as a quick taste, um, the bread and butter, are we re does demand response to pricing redistribute demand, either temporally or geographically? Uh, one very interesting district for us, so just a couple, a couple shots here. This is the marina, and if you know San Francisco, you know the marina has two main streets, Lombard and Chestnut. Um, Lombard is the block that no one wants to park on. Chestnut is where everyone wants to park on. The differential in rates at this point, I think, is $3.50 just around the block. Um, and so blue is Lombard, where people don't want to park. And finally, uh, we move rates in very small increments, 25 cents an hour every six to eight weeks. Uh, and you're seeing gradually uh, demand is shifting. It's, it's more pronounced off street in our, in our garages. This is just one of them performing arts. It's in the Civic Center area. The green bars are the prices. And we've lowered rates. It's now a dollar an hour all day to park there. It's cheaper than any meter in the area. Uh, and the blue is the occupancy, that, the peak occupancy. And that used to be 30%. You know, that garage was empty. Um, and now we're getting, actually in April, we are now raising the rates at that garage uh, because uh, we have been pretty successful in bringing people to it. Enforcement is another part of the project and another bottom line impact. Uh, we've made it really easy to pay it and to stay uh, with longer time limits and having new meters. 
so it means that enforcement uh, ticket, the number of citations issued has gone down dramatically, and that's great. That's great for our customers. That's great for our parking control officers. It also means that people are paying the meters and that prices are more relevant. So meters, just letting people pay finally, means that meter revenue is going up. Um, in short, it's it's mainly a wash revenue-wise, but we think we are. The whole focus has been the policy benefits. Uh, some of the things that we've been working on lately, uh, last fall we have been testing pretty quietly um, with some of our parking control officers real-time enforcement, bringing together real-time data from sensors and meters to show officers where um, there are spaces that are occupied but unpaid. And when they get there, they can see, as you see on the right, they can say, what happened? Was it a disabled placard uh, or was something else going on? So it's a great data collection tool, and it's really going to make the financial case for sensors. Do the sensors mean that those government employees are that much more productive. So it's, it's an interesting case um, that we'll, we're monitoring and evaluate later this year. Uh, we're continuing to build out our data management tool, uh, a proper private sector data management and analytical tool to operate the project. That was the first order of business, and now getting it in place to do the rigorous evaluation uh, of the project and to for ongoing operations, not just for parking, but for other parts of the transportation system that we manage. So really, and finally, trying to use more information to make better decisions. Another thing we just launched is special event pricing. This is one of the final pieces of our scope as a project. As of March 4th, uh, meters around the baseball stadium in San Francisco go until 10 p.m. And as of last weekend, we did our first special event rates of either $5 or $7 an hour, depending on how close you are to the stadium. Another thing we've been gearing up for is doing... Uh, trying to have another source of occupancy data rather other than sensors for rate changes. And we found an incredible correlation between payment status and occupancy. Payment status at the meters, is, we can impute occupancy from that um, given enough time. So that's something we're thinking through and want to test that on the street as an alternative to using sensors uh, for real-time information. Some of the other things that are coming up, I think the main thing here, the two that I really want to highlight are on-street Car sharing, on-street pods for car sharing as a tool, really facilitating car sharing. Car sharing gives us, helps us achieve so many goals that we want as a city at no cost to the city. So the, the urgent question of how do we get more of this stuff, one part of the answer is just on-street pods. And this is for us a strategy. Uh, one of the goals we want to achieve is reducing parking demand in an area. That's how it's relevant for this, for this audience. Another one that's critical for parking management in California is accessible parking or disabled parking. Uh, what do we do about that? How do we truly improve access for the disabled? Because the current situation um, isn't great for parking management, and it's certainly terrible uh, for the disabled who can't get around so well and need to park close to their destination. Six months ago, we convened a group of stakeholders with primarily disabled advocates in the, in the region and are working on a solution um, moving towards state legislation. That's something you'll hear more about in April. Lessons learned. Um, things to highlight here. You know, more than anything, this no doubt this is a parking project, but it's it's always surprising to me to what extent it's an IT project. Um, IT and technology is always in service of achieving things uh, and achieving the policy goals that we're, we're after, but uh, so much of our energy and resources have been put in that area, and that is hard to uh, emphasize enough. If you, I know we're trying to move fast, but if you do want to learn more, our website, we've, we've done as much as we can to share in, the, in our resources section. And especially uh, what you'll find there is, is this 130-page PDF, which was written for people like you, um, especially people in other cities. It was about a year and a half ago, which summarized what we'd done and lessons learned to that point. Um, so I think with that, thank you, and uh, well, looking forward to discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for those comments, Jay. Um, I think it's um, particularly interesting that you underscore that parking projects are, in fact, IT projects, especially since this is an ITS America event. And I think those of us who've tried to implement IT projects in the transportation space know about the specific challenges associated with resourcing and getting funding for the ongoing operations of IT projects. Um, it's also a perfect lead-in to Tom Valley, who um, is here with us today. He's a graduate of the University of Vermont, but he tells me he's spending lots of time basically living in San Francisco and watching parking spaces turn over as he uh, supports the installation of the technology. So, Tom, we look forward to hearing your comments. 
Uh, I actually don't have any slides. I was hoping to make this go as quickly as possible, too, so we can get right into questions. Um, I am assuming that everyone here understands at least reasonably well how our systems work in San Francisco. I'm going to give you the one-minute overview of that as well. Um, on a very basic level, there's a sensor embedded in the street. It speaks wirelessly to a network that's installed throughout the city, um, and that data is then forwarded to us over the cellular network that we implement. Um, we collate all that data and then forward that information in arrivals and departures to San Francisco in this case. Um, with many of our other clients, we provide a lot more services beyond that. Um, but in this case, San Francisco actually performs all of the back-end data collection and utilization and distribution um, component of that. Um, I came to this project actually in August of 2011, which gave me a very interesting perspective. Um, we had already been installed or had been installing for about a year. The project had been running for more than two years at that point. Um, and we were operating well. The entire city had been installed, had been installed very, very rapidly. Um, and we were struggling, struggling a little bit to keep the system performing at its optimum levels, um, struggling in the sense that it was taking a lot of effort to do that. So I was brought in primarily to look at the operation and implement some changes in process, changes in technology to reduce the operational effort to keep the system performing, um, which is what we've undertaken over the last 18 months. Um, to jump right to um, some of the most important lessons learned, uh, I think the most important lesson learned for myself and for our company um, is that planning and uh, a very, very patient implementation and testing of that implementation in phases is critical. Um, we actually implemented, I believe now in hindsight, um, we implemented the project too rapidly. Um, there were other reasons to make that happen, um, but it proved to be a very, very large complicating factor in getting the performance to the level that it needed to be. Um, hundreds or dozens and dozens of companies have implemented 200 or 300 or 400 space pilots and tests. And it's actually relatively easy to make a small, small area test look very good. Um, you can deploy resources across that kind of test very, very heavily um, without a lot of impact on you trying to operate the entire program. Um, going to over 8,000 spaces that's distributed across the entire city of San Francisco was an enormous leap. Um, and the secondary component of that is every region, especially in a city as dynamic as, as San Francisco, is almost like a distinct installation. Um, the interference issues, both from a radio network standpoint and from a sensor interference standpoint, the profiles of that shift dramatically across the installation. Some areas are incredibly easy to run. Some areas are phenomenally challenging to run. Um, and now with our testing of our newest sensors, we're actually focused on the most challenging areas, and that's where we're doing our initial testing. Um, because we believe that if we can manage to make those sensors work in those areas, um, we're going to be able to make them roll them out across the city much more readily um, and know that they're going to function. Um, another very important aspect that I just want to call out uh, is that after I came on to work with StreetSmart and was starting to work very closely with the technical folks at Circo and especially at, uh, that, are taking, that are managing the Asset Park project, we kind of shifted our focus and started being very, very, very open about what our own internal results were, what their results from testing were, and were operating in a much more collaborative way. Um, and that open collaboration really is the reason why today we're at a place where we're seeing roughly eight second latency from an event happening on the street to SF Park having that information about that event occurring. Um, we weren't there a year ago or a year and a half ago. Our latency numbers were substantially higher than that. Still within the bounds of what we were supposed to perform, but everybody has to agree that faster data is better data. Um, and it it that improvement helped all of us who are working on the project. Great. I definitely agree faster data is better data, and eight seconds sounds uh, pretty phenomenal. 
So uh, now to turn to a research perspective, I'd like to introduce uh, Dan Chapman from our very own UC Berkeley. Um, I note that one of his research interests is the nexus between residential location, commuting, and happiness. So um, maybe we'll hear a little bit about the nexus between excellent parking availability or good information about parking and happiness. Um, Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Um, hi, I'm Dan Chapman. I'm uh, in the Department of City and Regional Planning uh, here at UC Berkeley. Uh, here, well, up there, that way, up at UC Berkeley. Um, there have been a number of people involved in the project I'm, that I'm going to just discuss briefly. Um, and uh, I'm going to set my timer so I can, I'm, I'm uh, amazed by the precedent that my, the two people before me have set in terms of time, so I'm going to try to, to, to stick to that. Um, a lot of people have worked on this, this project, um, which has been essentially looking at uh, different blocks in San Francisco and collecting the sorts of information that you can't get from sensors to see um, more, to get more information about what is happening in terms of the changes on, on blocks that are seeing changes in price, either changes in price upwards or downwards. And the data that we collected is from um, late spring to early summer 2011, prior to price changes occurring, and then about a year later, and we're going to be doing another, another round of data on the same blocks uh, in the coming year. Um, and it looks like I'm having some delay on this thing's coming. Oh, okay. So, yes. Eight-second latency. My latency is not nearly as good as SF Park. Um, how, how does market-based pricing affect parking behavior? And specifically, how do block occupancy turnover and parking duration respond to price changes? This is a question that um, we can answer with sensor data. Uh, there are other questions that it's harder for us to answer with sensor data, but which are also interesting. One of them is how pricing might lead to changes in carpooling and the socioeconomics of parkers. And I'll talk about how I could possibly observe socioeconomics of parkers in a second. And then how does the use of disabled, disabled placards and other kinds of non-payment affect occupancy? And this is something that so far hasn't been possible to deal with with sensors. It'll be possible to deal with in, with a combination, perhaps, of sensors and enforcement, but there are lots of forms of non-payment on the street. So we chose 50 blocks from, this, um, from these four subsections of the SF Park project. And these are, these are geocoded meters, um, which are provided by, uh, by SF Park, who, as Jay was pointing out, has a lot of information available on their website. One of the things is, is this, uh, this shapefile. Um, and we went out there and we uh, observed. Um, and this is a, that's a picture of William Chow up there. He's observing in that picture. Um, <laughs> Um, very, very, uh, very worried expression on his face. Actually, William did a bu took a bunch of these pictures and, and did a, a bunch of the data work, uh, and he's gone off to MIT, so he's not here anymore. Uh, so we were out there uh, looking at, to collect a bunch of information. What we collected was, um, in addition to information about occupancy and payment and so on, we took the number of vehicle occupants, the vehicle type and the condition, the race ethnicity of drivers, information about double parking, and the reasons for payment or non-payment type. And we took information down for about 14,500 uh, parked cars over this period of, of time. So there's a lot of people um, going back and forth on BART um, in long, uh, spending long hours um, on, on, in these shifts. And uh, it was a, a huge coordination effort, which John Ergo and Sarah Fine um, uh, were the ones to, uh, to coordinate. Um, this is one thing that we can observe, which is a double parking or someone who's standing and, and waiting, uh, a form of congestion that might be caused by a lack of a parking space. Um, so there's two main causes, potentially, of congestion, in other words. One of them is there's no parking space available, so you're wandering and looking around. And the other thing is that people just double park because there's no space available. Um, and with observational data, again, we can get information on double parking. So what I want to show you is just some initial results of, um, of our analysis and our data, and I'm going to uh, show you an inscrutable uh, regression table in a minute. So in the meantime, um, this shows where we started in 2011 with meter prices and average vehicle values, which we estimated based on the following information, make, model, condition, and a very laborious and intensive process of matching that information to Kelly Blue Book values. Um, and what you see there is, I think, every single one of our 50 blocks represented with thin lines if they were meter prices of $2. $3 uh, meter prices are slightly thicker lines, and the thickest lines are meter prices of $3.50. Uh, a year later, the meter, meter prices for this set of blocks had changed. It ranged from as low as $0.25, cents, just a fact, just one time band in one block. 
Uh, and then everything else ranged between $1.75 up to $5.00 in 25 cent increments. So there's a huge variegation in price that was part of this, this program. So what you can see in general here is a correlation at this time, a fairly high correlation, this is information that we didn't actually have before, of higher parking prices and higher vehicle values. So fancier cars, newer cars, better condition cars in places with meters that have higher prices. And this uh, is not, not necessarily a surprise, um, uh, but uh, it's the first information on it. So then we also, as I said before, we collected information over time, and so one thing we looked at is changes in prices and vehicle prices and how those are cha correlated with changes in meter prices. Uh, so what you have here is the same blocks as before, but here you have little gray dashed boxes uh, denoting uh, blocks that did not increase in price, they decreased in price. So they're kind of out of the picture here for the moment. And we're seeing changes in vehicle prices which range all over the map, and in a nutshell, what you see here is nothing that you can make any sense of. <laughs> and the reason for that is that, at least at this juncture, what's happening here is there's no clear relationship between changes in price and changes in vehicle value. There's still a strong correlation between prices and vehicle value, but there's not a lot of, let's say, shifting out and pricing up of cars in response to, uh, you know, increasing value of cars. Why am I looking at the value of cars? Because it's highly correlated with income. So we're interested in this sort of this issue of, is there an equity concern, a true one, or is in fact there's something else going on uh, in changes in price? Um, so this also shows a map for, for the decrease in price. I'm going to skip over that one because I'm cognizant of the, the example set by my, uh, my uh, uh, predecessors here. This is the share of black and Hispanic drivers. Again, not be, um, we're not collecting this information because we're particularly focused on race ethnicity issues, but because black, Hispanic, and other non-white categories of drivers are uh, associated in the Bay Area with lower income. And so this is a, our, our best poor attempt at doing uh, an observation of income without actually trying to survey people. And what this shows is something similar to the, the, show, the, the map of prices. It's not quite as strongly correlated, but it is highly statistically significant. A very high share of black and Hispanic drivers on lower priced, priced blocks. Um, <clears throat> and what you'll see here is something similar to the previous slides of changes, which is you can't figure out what's happening. Again, there isn't much correlation between changes in price and changes in, in those, category, those uh, uh, variables. We also looked at forms of non-payment, and um, we do have some blocks with very, very high shares of drivers with disabled placards. And in fact, this isn't the share of drivers. This is actually the share of minutes. Um, di people who use disabled placards, uh, vehicles with disabled placards on them, are parked for roughly twice as long as those that do not have disabled placards on them. Um, and we have, a, 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 in some blocks, a very high share of minutes taken up by drivers with the table placards. And it turns out this is highly correlated with price and remains highly correlated with price. So higher price blocks have higher users of disabled placards. We didn't ask our, our observers to, um, to make any judgment whatsoever as to whether a driver emerging from a car was disabled. There's, there's no way to do that. Um, there are all kinds of disabilities that won't always manifest themselves visually. But there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that, um, that there is... Uh, uh, disabled placard abuse, and you've heard a little bit about that earlier. Um, again, changes in price, not, if, not very highly correlated with changes in the share of disabled placard. I'm going to show you one more uh, datum which is of interest, which is the percentage of time that one space is available. Um, this is an alternative measure of, of what we're after, which is on every block, we want one space available so that there is no need for people to search or, for, or, to, or to double park. People might still double park, uh, for example, delivery vehicles will often double park regardless because it's just faster for them to double park. In other words, for them to park in the street, get out and deliver and get back in their vehicle. So a space wouldn't necessarily make a difference for those folks, but, um, but nevertheless, one space per block as opposed to a percentage uh, uh, um, uh, target is, is a valuable target because it speaks more directly to this, uh, this question. And because it, uh, this is based on minute-by-minute minute averages. So we took our information and we got it down to the minute-by-minute. Minute. Um, we did see significant changes here, and I'm going to talk about those in a minute. The changes that we saw are, well, they're put on this, on this slide. Um, uh, what, what we saw was essentially very high cross-sectional correlations initially between the following things. Number one, I've already said this, 
vehicle price, share black Hispanic, highly correlated, uh, higher vehicle prices for higher priced blocks, lower shares of black and Hispanic parkers for higher priced blocks. We also saw the following, lower occupancy per vehicle for higher priced blocks. In other words, higher priced parking is parked in by people who are less likely to have other passengers in their car. There could be lots of reasons for this. It could be price and sensitivity of, 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 you know, different sorts of households. And, you know, it could be that the people who are driving alone are using it for for purposes, parking for purposes that are less flexible, less discretionary. For example, they're parking for work, and they're less likely to bring passengers because carpooling for work is less less common than carpooling for for other purposes. Um, you will see that, that, that uh, well, you won't see necessarily see it, um, but let me just describe it to you. The one change that was in this, in this period of time from 2011 to 12 significant was an unanticipated increase in the percentage of time there wasn't at least one space available in blocks that had larger increases in prices. And I think what's happening here is a, l- a larger uh, pattern, which is, which is the following. Over this period of time, and this is not up-to-date data, as I said, this is observational data through summer of last year, essentially, um, is that prices haven't changed enough. Uh, prices haven't changed enough to have all the kinds of effects that we expect them to have on these blocks. And we chose blocks that were more active um, than the average SF Park block because we wanted to be able to have a good cross-section of uh, blocks that changed, increased in price and, and blocks that decreased in price. So um, that brings up this issue of how much can prices change? And uh, we have uh, what I understand to be a legislative limit on that in, in San Francisco, which is to only go up to $6, and that might not be enough uh, for every, all kinds of changes to happen. And then the final thing I want to just point out here is that over time we are seeing a reduction in the cross-sectional correlations between these proxies for socioeconomic status and price, which, by which I mean to say over time it appears that there's less and less of a relationship, um, even though this is you know, tentative information that we'll have to verify with further data. Uh, this could be a good thing or it could, might not be such a good thing. We might, in other words, be seeing a phenomenon where uh, people who have fewer choices for off-street parking, for example, for work, are more likely to continue to park for on-street purposes even if prices go up. They may be in- inflexible and not have other options. Um, and so that's just something to, to think about and figure out what it implies for continued support for uses of the parking funds for transit, for example. It would be, you know, we, we want to make sure that we are continuing to use the funds in ways that are um, providing benefits to those who are priced off the blocks. Um, and then I want to make one final comment. This is a picture I showed um, at a presentation last year. Um, if you can see these vehicles, every single one of them has a disabled placard um, on them. This is an entire block full of, of um, cars with disabled placards. Um, uh, roughly um, half of all minutes that were observed in these 50 blocks were paid. The other half were not paid. Um, now, I, this is why I need to talk to Jay about how this correlates with other data from these blocks and ter- current data in other blocks. But it's interesting to, interesting to note that we, we have this issue of non-payment and that a substantial fraction at this time was in the form of about a half, of the, half of the half, 25% to 30% was disabled placards, and the other half were other forms of non-payment, a lot of which was simply, as I said yesterday, not paying. Uh, people sitting there standing, and some of them, they're ve- people in the car, and they're waiting, and they'll, and they'll get out of the, the vehicle if, if a, an enforcement officer comes. So uh, with that, I want to just go ahead and stop, and we can have, uh, and have discussion, and sorry for taking 13 minutes. I shouldn't have done that because he needs to do that. I'll just say while we're waiting that I think it's really exciting listening to um, Dan's initial analysis of sort of the equity issues related to um, pricing this scarce parking resource. Um, Certainly the application of pricing to a whole variety of transportation issues is something um, I think we as an industry are engaged in and we're certainly engaged in that right here in this region as we experiment with things like time of day pricing on the San Francisco Bay Bridge tolls, at um, in- implementing a regional um, express lane network, and the question of equity in those, in those cases is always one that comes up that must be addressed. Um, but I think it, it, the jury's still out on sort of what the, what the real behavioral impacts will be. We're hearing in focus groups that people at all economic levels want the choice to be able to park, to be able to pay, to be able to go faster in an express lane. So, um, 
So that's what I think we're all trying to offer at this point, and we'll see how that pans out. All right, it looks like we have Alan Greenberg with us here. Alan, um, can you hear us, Alan? Can you all hear me over the phone? That sounds very good. Yes, welcome, Alan. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, thank you. Um, I uh, have... I uh, appreciate being included. I know it's difficult for people in an audience to have to uh, uh, listen to a presentation remotely. And I apologize if there's an ambulance going by at the moment. Um, let me uh, just start with a little bit of background. And the way I like to think about the issue of technology is really as an enabler. Um, there's a lot that we're trying to do at the Federal Highway Administration with pricing. And Technology gives us the tools to be able to do more things than we otherwise be able to do. Hello? I don't know if you all can see me over Skype or not, or hear me. Um, they do have my phone number. I'm going to assume you can, even though I can't hear you, and I'll continue to talk. Um, the um, Value Pricing Pilot Program typically funds projects that entail uh, tolling, and it wasn't until uh, 2005 with Safety Lou that uh, Congress... Um, we authorized our program and required that three million of the twelve million dollars per year, at a minimum, goes towards um, projects that. Uh, let's see. Okay, you can hear me. Good. <laughs> uh, and now I can hear you. Hello. Oh, so I'll keep talking. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. So um, when we look at different types of pricing besides tolling, Congress required us to spend a portion of our money for non-toll pro projects. Why? Well, one reason is that uh, you can't deal with, you can't address congestion in cities unless you're dealing with strategies other than toll strategies. And there's a lot of good ones. Parking pricing is a, a really important one, as other speakers have discussed over the last couple of days, but there are others. Uh, there's full vehicle use pricing through strategies such as car sharing to get people out of their cars. Uh, there's pay-as-you-drive auto insurance, uh, which would take a, a fixed insurance cost and make it variable. But parking pricing has many dimensions to it. It's not uh, uh, just uh, dealing with congested commercial corridors uh, or overly demanded on-street parking, although that's very, very important. And uh, we put a lot of, we being Federal Highways, put a lot of resources in SF Park. We're delighted uh, with the benefits based not just on parking, but giving a commuter uh, the similar benefit, regardless of whether they are driving and parking or taking transit or an alternative. So you want to give commuters uh, incentives to shift to other modes, um, one neat project we funded in University of Minnesota uh, was with commuters, actually, in Minnesota, where we took a monthly parking pass that these people were purchasing, and we actually just made it variable. If you didn't use it some days, you would get a rebate. If you use transit instead of parking, you get a partial rebate. And we found a huge reduction in the amount of driving and parking that people did. We're also doing a couple of neat experiments in both Berkeley, the uh, university, and uh, Stanford, um, and I've written some of this stuff up. I've shared this write-up with the organizers. Um, and we've also put together something called the Parking Pricing Primer, uh, which really looks at the whole suite of strategies uh, and what's going on throughout the country. So, um, and by the way, if you Google Parking Pricing Primer, uh, FHWA, you can find it online uh, and it's available uh, at no charge. So, um, in terms of... Uh, commuters, uh, in addition to cash out, we um, are very pleased with a part of the SF Park project that Jay didn't really talk much about, but there's a, a, a small incentive for people that park for multiple hours to actually leave and come in slightly outside of the commute hours. 
and they get a little bit off of their parking rate. We're excited to see what kind of shift in behavior that may lead to. Um, the other um, uh, kinds of projects that we're seeing related to this um, are um, uh, in the uh, home side area, where we're trying to give people opportunities to live without cars or to live with fewer cars. There was a very neat experiment in the Bay Area where we looked at households that had um, um, bundled parking with their leases, meaning that the cost of the parking was uh, included in the lease cost and meaning that the lease cost was more expensive uh, versus uh, housing where you had to pay separately. And then we added in, in some cases, that housing had car sharing, in some cases it didn't. And there was a tremendous reduction in car ownership and ultimately in usage for uh, households that chose to live in areas where there was a combination of car sharing and uh, bundled parking. Um, so there's a lot, um, a lot of different strategies depending upon what your focus area is. Um, the uh, SF Park strategy is particularly great for uh, commercial corridors. We're seeing that expanded now. We funded a, a project in New York City called Park Smart, where they're going to be doing negotiations with up to 25 retail areas um, to institute some form of parking price and to make the on-street parking uh, work. And that's, I know, a lot of uh, really what the whole purpose of the SF Park program is. Uh, now, the question as to data and what kind of information you need and what sort of technology you need, well, it depends. In the case of the Minnesota variable price permit that I mentioned for the monthly parkers, these permits needed the capacity to know when somebody was taking transit or not. It needed to check in and out every day so we knew what time people, we knew what days they went in. Um, in the case of offering rebates, when you're coming in or out during off peak times, you need to be able to record that. Um, and the uh, project that we're doing in, in uh, uh, Stanford is particularly unique because what we're doing in actually both Berkeley and Stanford is in a university setting, it's typical that a member of the faculty or professor will purchase a, an annual or semi-annual parking pass. It's usually in a very desirable place because they may need that parking um, for perhaps once, twice a week that they have either an early class or they're schlepping some things. And um, one um, approach is what if on days you don't absolutely need the best parking space, you can park more remotely and then we could save the best parking spaces for people that need them. And then we don't have to build as much where it's uh, in, in the most desired areas of the campus. And um, so the, in the case of Stanford, we're actually doing a lottery incentive style approach where people will be given a status and they can maintain the status by, par by parking remotely or by um, uh, driving in and off peaks or in, and avoiding peak travel. And uh, the status um, entitles you to uh, a, a award probability and there are lottery awards and so forth. Very clever using sort of behavioral economic strategies um, to incentivize people to continuously behave in the way you want, which means that if parking is really important to you one day, if you need the best spot, if you need to come in the peak period, great, use it. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure it's available in those instances. But for days where it's not critical, days that you have options, um, we want to give you an incentive not to. And we find that when we do this consistently, we really get great results. And the alternative is you're trying to build more parking in the campus uh, or you're trying, um, or, or you're restricting people's use of parking who could make very good use of parking and so forth. Um, so that's kind of an overview. I, I know it's, uh, I, I have, I certainly could talk uh, a lot more, but I know it's difficult to listen and uh, hear somebody from uh, a remote presentation sometimes, and we've been having some technical problems today. So I hope I hope I came across okay, and I'm certainly uh, happy to engage in Q&A um, as well. Thank you. All right. Um, well, great that we got to have Alan's involvement, and we've got the panelists coming back up to the table. So the reason for the brevity of all of their discussions was to allow more time for this portion um, for questions and answers from all of you. And I'm scanning around to see what brave soul has the first question to ask of this esteemed panel. 
Scott. And I think um, we're asking folks to come down to these microphones, if possible, so that um, so that the audio will enable everyone to hear. Thanks. Yeah, and I think I think this question is for you. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. Over the last uh, day and a half, we've heard a lot about pricing and, and about whether <coughs> pricing is in fact high enough. And I'm I'm kind of in, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about that. And so what is high enough? You know, what, what do we think we really can charge, both in terms of affecting behavior, but from a social standpoint as well? I don't think that's a question just for me. I think that other people can answer that too. But um, about to give it my shot, a shot. Um, so the the economist's answer to the question is the the the, the high enough price is that which results in the um, socially efficient outcome. In this case, arguably, that outcome is making sure that there isn't a lot of search for parking, parking search. So eliminating parking search would be one criterion. Um, it really matters what you do with the funds that you collect to mitigate issues that arise when you are pricing people off of, pricing, in fact, a class of people, maybe, out of, out of parking in certain areas. Um, those people, perhaps, were able to compete before uh, for those parking spots just by getting there first or by being more willing to look for a parking spot for a longer period of time. Their value of time might be lower. And these attributes aren't so highly associated with their income. In fact, they might be negatively associated with income. So if you're taking those funds and you're using them for, to improve alternative forms of transportation into the area, that's actually a great, uh, a, a great way to mitigate whatever the impacts might be. So what this focus on issues of, of socioeconomic status and parking is meant to inform is, you know, what is happening and therefore what ought to be done. And it, there are lots of different options as to what ought to be done. But to, go to get my answer to your first question is, the high enough price is the price that, that is resulting in um, the, the elimination, essentially, of parking search. Uh, I'm sure Jay has a different answer to that question. Um, well, there's, a, there's always a lot of emphasis on that end of the, of the price spectrum. Uh, we usually emphasize the other end, which is that of metered hours in SF Park Pilot areas, as of our 10th rate change, about 17% of those are now 25 cents an hour. Um, that, that, that that's enough, and that's the right price. The, the 1% of hours that are now at $6 an hour is where it gets a lot of attention. Uh, but we've, on, on the whole, the average rate in SF Park areas has gone down from about $2.73 uh, at the beginning of the project uh, to now, I think it's two dollars and fifty something. Uh, so that's something that is underappreciated. Uh, so in general, uh, the right price at the very few blocks, uh, who knows what it would be at the highest demand. But in general, at ninety-five percent of the blocks, let's say, uh, it, it's probably lo a lot lower than we'd expect. That in general, when we manage parking with meters, uh, meters really work as management tools, and that maybe real small changes um, could be enough. take the opportunity to ask a question, which is that, Jay, at one point during your presentation, you talked about the fact that payment status might be good enough to infer occupancy, and maybe that's good enough in terms of actually just saying, well, we're going to use payment instead of, instead of instrumenting all of these spaces in order to have even better, more accurate data. And I'd like for um, you and Tom to both talk about the trade-offs you know, operationally and pragmatically speaking, um, is there a way to do SF Park Light? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a critical question for um, every other city that didn't have the luxury of incredible federal funding. Um, so a, a light version. Um, sensors are expensive, and surely they're, they're, the quality is improving, the performance is improving, the price is going to continue to go down. They're great. Um, it's, it's really enabled a lot of interesting things. With, I think, the trade-off uh, with other sources of data, whether it's imputing from, from meter, from payment status, or just using clipboards and walking around like uh, really important cities have done, uh, like Redwood City in Seattle, uh, New York, you know, cities that I really admire and I think are really showing the way um, that in a way that's very relevant. Uh, the trade-offs involve just the complexity of rate changes and the frequency. Um, how granular can you be? Uh, with sensors, that's probably that's at one end of the spectrum where that allows you to do the most. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, maybe instead of um, 
time of day pricing, you just do flat rate changes, or you do them less frequently, or you do them in less uh, in a less granular fashion, not block to block, but by zone or by neighborhood. Um, those are those are possibilities with obvious trade-offs. Um, SF Park, I think, is a demonstration of one end. I'm really excited about what other cities have done. We are trying to. Um, having both data sets puts us in a unique position to really see and work out the problems with doing using meter payment status as a proxy. And we're going to see how that goes. We're anxious to test that later this year. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think my biggest comment is it really depends on what the use of the data is. So if in a situation where you are purely looking to do demand-based pricing changes on a relatively flexible schedule, in most cases, you're going to get directional enough data to be able to drive those pricing changes and have them make sense. Now, granted, I want you to put sensors in every possible space mm -hmm. that you can, so do a lot of the other folks in this room. Um, but what we're seeing is that there are multiple uses for that data. So SF Park was really a study primarily in demand-based pricing and its impacts, but moving to a situation where that same sensor data is used to provide enforcement um, or is used to provide wayfinding or other outputs from that data set um, and correlated with the fact that as the technology matures, the prices are coming down, the complexity of implementing is coming down, um, there's going to be a point where there truly is a tipping point that it makes sense to use a sensor to drive enforcement, to drive wayfinding, um, and then have that data available to do demand-based pricing, to potentially do timed parking, to do all of those other things. As accuracy goes up and cost goes down. Another, another thing to add in favor of sensors is that um, that really rich data set makes a lot of things possible, probably a lot of things we haven't imagined as a, as a room. Uh, one, and especially when matched with a real data management system, one way we're using that data now is not just to direct enforcement in real time, but we can bring together sensor data, meter data, and citation data to calculate uh, capture rate and compliance uh, meaning for enforcement, meaning if there's 100 cars on the street, how many have paid? And then of 100 ticket opportunities on the street, how many did parking patrol officers actually capture or write? Um, that has some obvious implications for deploying those folks and becoming more efficient. Uh, so it's a, I think, um, you know, it's a complex question. Right in the middle. Um, does SF Park do parking benefit districts? Um, if so, do those predate or are they part of SF Park? And can you do market uh, rate parking without parking without get parking benefit districts and get public bond? Yeah, we we do not do parking benefit districts, and there's a very um, clear reason for that. By city charter, the constitution of our city, all revenue uh, from meters, meters and citations returns to the city, returns to the MTA to fund transit. That's how we pay. It's about 35% of our operating budget for transit. It's, a, it's part of the um, response to the equity concerns, uh, at least in San Francisco. Um, no doubt, uh, parking benefit districts, sharing revenue is a, a powerful political tool. I know that's been useful in other cities. Uh, we've been able to do this without that. And we've often, when talking about it, people ask, hey, we'd like some of this revenue. Uh, we try to remind people that, that Muni public transit is a citywide benefit that's good for everybody. I wouldn't ask this question, except that I saw Dan put up a slide that showed back end parking out on the upper left hand corner. Uh, is this part of the study? That's one question. If so, what were the results? It wasn't part of the study. There, there are several studies that have looked at safety issues and also time, the time that it takes for people to park in different parking configurations. Um, but no, it wasn't, it wasn't part of the study. But you make a good point. There is good evidence that back-end parking is safer. You, you, see, you, you, just to point out, though, back-end parking is relevant to stall-style st stall parking, not parallel parking. And most of the parking in SF Park is actually parallel parking. So, um, but I don't think anyone's, anyone on volunteer <laughs> in the study? I see some people raising their hands over there, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are these questions or answers over here? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I figured I was wrapping up, but I have another question. 
Okay, so I saw a hand over here and then we'll go over there. Back up here in the left. Well, there's a, for the notification, just letting people know what the prices are. Uh, there's a lot goes into it, but to reduce it by law, uh, we have to let people know online for on-street rate changes seven days in advance. Uh, and for garages, as a practical matter, we need to let people know 30 days in advance, especially whenever we change monthly rates because people buy at the beginning of the month. Um, as far as logistically how to make rate changes happen, uh, that took a couple years, really. I'm working very closely with the meter vendors and a level of technical integration that I <laughs> was, uh, it, we really pushed uh, the meter vendors and worked together to make that possible to, we send them an XML file. After we make, after we process the data, um, make a rate change recommendation. That's improved internally. We create an XML file, which is a very uh, thorough data interchange protocol, and send that to the meter vendors. Uh, we do some back and forth to make sure that uh, they've understood it correctly and just from a, a data perspective, that nothing fell through the cracks, and then they push it to the meters, and we field verify. And it shows up on the meter electronically? That's right. That we, uh, because there's 7,000-plus meters in this area, and then we have 30,000 in the city, we knew we had to come up with a way. Our meter shop could not and would not go and touch every meter every six weeks. That just wasn't, wasn't feasible. So we had to have a way to push rates out to the meters and had to rely on what are very limited LCD displays on the meters um, to display those rates. And that was one of the core limitations for the project and why there are, for example, three rate bands, um, 9 to 12, 12 to 3, 3 to 6, rather than 4. That literally, that was all the room that there was on the meter. Yeah, just as a comment on this issue of, of information, getting back to the question of when people uh, go to a block, assuming that they're not on their app driving, let's hope that they're not, um, and assuming that they haven't gotten the most recent, w they can either know from previous experience or know only when they look on, at the meter. And so the, um, this brings up the question of how important information mm -hmm. is to people's parking decisions. And if the changes are incremental on in the way that they've been in SF Park, it's going to be an additional 25 cents at the most, or maybe 50 cents lower. So that's not going to be a, a huge problem for people, presumably. The question is, if you're trying to do more, rent, more dynamic pricing that varies on a daily basis, the information available at the block level in wayfinding is going to be a much bigger issue. And this is an issue in LA Express Park when they're trying to do dynamic price, ch price changes. Okay, we've got a question over here in the back. Yeah, the, the one screen that caught my attention was the significant increase in parking in your garage from, I think, it was 30% to 80%. So I've got two questions on that. Is one, how did the, the, the drivers or the parkers find out about that off-street garage, both its rates and its availability? And I think I can partially answer that through the smartphone. But the second on answer to that is there are many, many, many off-street operators running off-street lots. And how do those folks... How do you see those folks playing into uh, what you put together that, that with SF Park or with any city-based city, city based application? So I've been asked to repeat the question. Unless folks are going to actually come down to the microphone, we'll have to um, have the questions twice. So basically, in a nutshell, the, questions were, the question was, how, there was an increase in use of garages. How did parkers find out about the garages? And what are the impacts of... of SF Park, essentially, on the many, many off-street operators. And we know from yesterday, the, major the majority of those are in private hands, not publicly operated. So the Performing Arts Garage, that's one of 14 uh, that's part of this project. That one does have a particular story. Um, in general, the way we let people know about rate changes at garages, uh, they're obviously posted outside the garage. They're on the real-time information. One thing we've paid a lot of attention to is just the simple stuff, like windmasters. Those are the things that you drag out and put out in front of the garage. With performing arts, it was really easy. Once it was $1 an hour, we could have those windmasters all around the garage, on the sidewalk, catching driver's eye. And when you see $1 an hour, uh, we think that worked. Uh, we also, it's in the Civic Center, uh, where it's a huge employment center, and it was an easy place for us to do a lot of targeted marketing and to make sure that people were aware of the rates. That was effective. Um, as far as private operators and what their opinion is, you probably have to ask them. I, my sense of it and what we've heard uh, over the years, MTA has been a, a accused 
of suppressing market rates in off-street facilities. Um, we, our rates changed every 12 to 18 months by, by our board. They were very inflexible. Um, we were the, the opposite of demand responsive. Um, so now we change rates every three months, which is still pretty, pretty slow compared to our, um, our neighbors, our competitors, who change rates every 10 minutes uh, based on demand. But we, I think we are closer. Um, some of them have said, have really appreciated the changes in SF Park because I think they feel that, especially for monthly rates, and daily rates, which we've increased. We've tried to discourage the use of garages for commuting. So we've increased our early bird rates. We've had early bird change. It means you have to enter before 8.30 rather than 10 a.m. There's nothing early about 10 a.m. Um, so some of the neighboring garages and lots have said, oh, this is great. You're, uh, you're pushing customers to us. Um, thank you. Uh, I think it, it is, we're gathering, those are some anecdotes. Uh, we're gathering parking DAX data as well. I think to really get at it in a more rigorous way, Parking tax in San Francisco is a 25% tax on every private parking uh, facility. So if you pay $10 to park, two of that comes to the city, comes to us, uh, to fund Muni. Uh, we're gathering parking tax uh, data citywide, so we'll be able to look at what happened at our garages, in the surrounding on-street meters, as well as at private lots in a somewhat aggregated way. We can't identify particular businesses um, to, get, to get at that a bit. I think Jay raises a really important point, which is that in order to provide good parking information, we, there are huge organizational challenges in trying to um, just get consolidated information about the plethora of public and private parking uh, resources that are out there. Um, so let's see. We've got a question over here, and then we'll go up here to the middle. Thanks, Carol. Um, I'm, I'm Brian Burke. I'm the chair of the Northern California section of ITS California. Thank you for coming. Um, a question, I wonder if you can put the SF Park in context of um, congestion pricing, cordon pricing that we heard about and was uh, in the news quite a bit towards the end of 2010. Haven't heard about it lately and wondering if what the city's decisions are going to be based on some of the early results from SF Park. So if you, if you haven't heard, if you're not from the area, you might know um, that in San Francisco, something that the city considered, and I think it, it was more public four or five years ago, was congestion pricing a la London or Stockholm and looked at different scenarios. That, of course, was uh, a controversial possibility. And, and different, different leaders and stakeholders in the city said, let's try this parking-based approach first uh, before we, we push that any farther. That's something that uh, FHWA, a more in-depth study of the parking-based approach is something that FHWA has funded uh, that, that we'll be working on with the County Transportation Authority to, to look at just that. So I think some of that is, the answer to your question is TBD, um, pending evaluation of SF Park, how well did it really work and deliver the benefits we're looking for, and then how some of the other parking-based strategies uh, look when we model them uh, with our partners at the uh, Transportation Authority. What do people think? What do, you, our, what do our customers think? Has this been a good thing for them? Is there data on this? Um, starting with an anecdote, just anecdotally, um, people seem to really like it. And what's not to like? You can pay really easily at the meter. The time limits have been lengthened either four hours or no time limit at all. There's real-time information. Um, living, living in the area, um, people in San Francisco are pretty quick to let us know if they don't like it, something. Uh, and we've people have... We really haven't had any complaints about the pilot projects. Uh, they've been pretty warmly received. M very notably, we've had zero complaints after 10 rate changes. Yeah, and that, that feels like a minor miracle of, of communications. Um, and uh, so we're proud of that. Uh, as far as data and evaluating, uh, getting at this in a more quantitative way, uh, this uh, May, a social science research firm, Ewald Wasserman, will be out again. They gathered before data. They'll be doing the after data. Clipboard surveys out on the street, huge sample size, asking people questions um, that I think we'll get at the answer you're looking for. 
you also asked about how is this for economic vitality and how we manage parking and transportation really matters for the economic vitality and growth of our city. We're gathering sales tax data as well to see in pilot areas versus control and really the rest of the city, did this help those areas grow more um, when compared to other parts of the city? We'll see. Um, you know, I would say that this answer varies depending on, on um, the nature of of the proposed uh, intervention. So there, have been, there has been some controversy about raising prices or putting meters in residential, primary residential areas in San Francisco. And so how the money is used starts to become a critical aspect of how you can get those, those uh, parking, area, parking uh, areas metered and how to, to impl apply this kind of an approach in places where the local stakeholders are going to have a different, a different a feeling about price increases than in a primarily non-residential area. Um, so this is where the, the constitution of, of the city may be a real impediment in being able to adopt primarily residentially oriented pricing, um, where they can't essentially provide benefits to the, to the neighborhood um, by charter. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that there might be some possibility of, of moving in that in some other direction at some point, because um, it, it, different audiences respond differently. And you'll see some people, you'll see, you, read, you can read newspaper articles, and there'll be some people who are quoted. I mean, a, a newspaper article, newspaper reporter's job, no offense to the newspaper reporters in the, in the room right now, is to get uh, to both sides, so-called, of, 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 the, of the story. And so you can always find people who will complain about rates going up. I mean, you know, um, in, a, in a newspaper article, you'll see this, examples of this. You also see people who say why they think it's a good idea, because they can get a parking space. And other people, of course, saying, well, I can't afford it there anymore. Makes sense, right? So it really matters how the money gets used, I think, that's being collected. So we have time for just a couple more questions. I wanted to point out as well, there's a, t um, I don't know who's leading it, there is a tour of SF Park this afternoon, correct? Uh, a virtual tour. Okay. Uh, I think in this room, if I, just from a deeper dive into if you want to learn more about the project, and I'm going to go through that presentation um, quickly, just so we have time to, to talk. If you bought your goggles, everyone got their goggles, right? <laughs> no? Yeah. So, 3D. Um, let's see. Right here in, up in the back? Um, oh, sorry. sorry, way back. <laughs> Uh, so the question was, um, if you said there's these, re these relationships and data between price and all these other variables, how come, in fact, there's no relationship when the changes happen? Um, that sounds like a reasonable question. Um, so th so th the short answer is um, we need more data from a longer period of time where there are larger price changes because we looked at it for just that one-year period, and we're going to be out in the field doing another, another round. Um, the second one is that um, if you're looking at 50 block faces, and I did the analysis with 50 block faces and three time bands, so roughly 150 observations, that's not a lot of observations to gain statistical significance. So uh, there are some technical ways of trying to address these, these issues. You may recall that my title was initial findings. So it's a standard academic weasel way of getting out of whatever they, <laughs> whatever they actually are saying. But... Um, but the initial analysis isn't getting down to the level of the minute or the level of the parked car itself and looking at questions of how parked car, each parked car um, is different in terms of duration and socioeconomics. Looking at that level of analysis may make it easier to see patterns that otherwise tend to be obscured by averaging and by relatively few observations and by, so far, relatively small changes in price. I, does that answer the question, sort of? I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards and yeah. tell you more. Okay, we've got one last question. How long does it take for a step change in price to propagate through and then settle out to a new uh, option as well? Um, <laughs> we're, we're not sure. Um, what we do is after changing the rates, we wait for at least a week uh, before gathering data for two weeks and then pushing a to... Then it takes about another two or three to actually execute a rate change. So that's that's why we... We would be very hard-pressed to do a rate change any, anything more frequently than every five weeks. Every six weeks is, 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 is about our limit. Um, I, in retrospect, that's something that we could go back and look at um, more carefully when we have that time, and that would be an interesting part of the evaluation. You know, there's different ways of doing price changes. You can do one block 
increase it an hour, let every, a dollar, let everything else stay the same. That's easier to answer the question. But what's happening at SF Park is multiple, the landscape is changing. The entire landscape is changing. And that is, that's a good thing, but analyzing its effects, I mean, you're talking about a, a lot of spatial uh, complexity. And um, in a way, that's why looking at the LA Express model is a little different, because they've done very targeted, directed, large changes and not done changes elsewhere. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's a very different response, and, and the, the equilibrium that you're looking for is going to happen faster in that instance, I would think. All right, well, it's clear that we're all going to continue to have our eyes on the work of Jay and Tom and Dan and Alan. So um, with that, I'd like everybody to give our panel a nice uh, round of applause. <laughs> Okay, so before we go to our break, we're going to do uh, two quick um, sponsor spotlights. Uh, so first, we've got Floyd Williams, Vice off. President of Parking for Census Networks. So much more on my phone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and a belated welcome to Berkeley, which is uh, my hometown. And the hometown of Census Networks. Um, so real quick, how many of you know Census Networks? Raise your hands. Quite a few. Okay, so that's good to see, given all the sensor companies we've talked about this week. Census Networks is primarily known for its traffic applications. Uh, we pioneered uh, the wireless sensor network for traffic 10 years ago. We hold many of the uh, fundamental patents on the technology, including those that enable the 10-year battery life of our sensors. Uh, we've developed dozens of applications over the years for transit and traffic, things you're familiar with. Uh, we have hundreds of customers around the world, have installed over 120,000 of our original magnetometer-based sensor. So as Tom was talking about, that real-world depth of experience is very important when considering a sensor company. For parking, we have a brand new sensor, and uh, that's what I'd really like to talk about briefly. It's called Micro Radar, and it's very different from our original magnetometer-based sensor. Micro Radar uses an ultra-low power radar to actively uh, sense the parking events that take place in front of it. This uh, provides a unprecedented accuracy of detection and a very precise timing on the beginning and the end of parking sessions. And for those high value applications that the panel was just talking about, like guided enforcement and wayfinding, it's critical to have this precise timing so that you can correlate uh, space occupancy data with payment data and citation data. Um, so uh, we're we're sort of new to parking, but we're actually quite active in many areas. If you look at the four areas that we've talked about at the symposium, uh, in truck parking, we're just concluding a three-month trial with our partner Siemens AG in Germany and their customer, the Autobahn, uh, in Los Angeles. As Dan alluded to yesterday, we'll be deploying our sensors in a surface lot downtown. Uh, with SF Park, we've been actively trialing in two locations. I think uh, Tom mentioned some of these more challenging locations where electromagnetic interference causes problems for the sensors. Microradar is immune to those problems, and the sensors have been performing fantastically. And then for off-street parking, we're involved in a very innovative project with Stanford University. As Alan alluded to, there's a lot of uh, activity down there on using lottery as incentives. Uh, but what Stanford has done with our sensors is they put them on the top deck of a parking structure, and they're using that information to infer occupancy for the whole structure, and they use that for parking guidance and guide enforcement. They're also using our sensor for in and out counts. So lots of exciting things going on with uh, micro radar and census networks. Uh, because we are based in Berkeley, uh, we are going to hold an open house uh, after the symposium concludes today. So I'd like to invite you all to attend if you'd like to learn more. Uh, you can see me during the break, and I'll be happy to arrange uh, directions and whatnot for you. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Floyd. And we have uh, one more before we, we go to break, and that's David Leingang, the Director of Business Development for TCS International. Good morning. Thank you. David Leingang, TCS International. Um, interesting to be here because we are a company that's been in both the ITS arena and the parking arena since we were founded in 1999. And so now we're starting to see these two industries talk to each other more, come together and realize that we have a need for each other. Um, we're part of the QFree group. Some of you are familiar with QFree, uh, a large European uh, active traffic management company that came to us at the end of 20, 
uh, 12 to specifically be have use us for the, their parking uh, technology. Um, let's see if I even have this that works. Okay, great. Well, a little bit of some of our different um, equipment, our single space sensors, which I have out there. We use a, a variety of uh, means to push our parking information to the customer, whether it's a smartphone app, whether it's a website, whether it's wayfinding signage. All that comes from our sensors that are in the garage or in on-street spaces. So, um, been around since 1999. We have uh, over 150 installations in eight countries around the world. So really uh, have a large depth and breadth of uh, when it comes to parking. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about our technology, go through some quick uh, major projects, and then be happy to talk to you afterwards uh, out at our, at our booth. Uh, some of our uh, um, customers, and you can see that their universities, that their airports, their hospitals, their casinos, Anybody with a parking uh, structure that wants to get folks quickly parked and into where they, where they need to do. And what we are seeing more of is cities that are coming to us because they realize they can no longer neglect parking as a means of urban congestion. So they say, what are these large systems that you have that can, can combine all of, your parking, all of our parking facilities into one network where we can manage this from one location? That's what we do. Um, so I don't have any fancy videos, but I do have some cartoons. Uh, so, <laughs> but basically, here's an example of where you have wayfinding signage around town at key intersections that's directing people to uh, the garages. Um, and each sign will tell you what's the up-to-date count in the garage. That's a typical system that we have. Um, then if you go down into the garage, you have your individual space sensors. Um, normally it's green if it's free. It turns red when somebody pulls in. Uh, might be blue for handicapped. All that is uh, updated uh, in real time as the vehicles go uh, underneath the sensors, pushed out all wirelessly to uh, the server and to where the manager is. doesn't have to be in the garage, can be uh, at another location. Um, then if you're looking at just inside the garage itself, not with an individual sensor, but say you just want to count on level, and we have sensors that uh, track the vehicles as they go in and out of the garage and also transition between the levels, all updated in real time with signage. Uh, for the parker. And the interesting thing about this is that we have a technology where you can put three of our sensors that straddle a uh, large, uh, say about a 24, 25 foot width in the garage. You don't really need strict delineation there, but it doesn't matter which way the cars uh, drive. You could have one going each direction. You could have two going the same direction. They could cut corners. The system is smart enough to recognize that and to, and to count those. Um, and then finally, we talked about this a lot of talk about the embedded sensor that's in the street or in a surface lot. We also do that, too. The same sort of wireless technology, providing that real-time information, pushing it out to uh, signage and to the person that's managing uh, the parking. So let me just touch on uh, three uh, quick installations. The, probably the one that gets the most attention is the city of San Jose. And um, there are 10,000 parking spaces in six garages, 13 signs, around the city, and all that's being managed by our system. So just about wherever you go, when you get off the interstate, there's a large sign that's going to tell you where you can go to find the parking in San Jose. And they look like this, and you see there's an up-to-date, uh, there we go. What's the real-time count of the, the garages? And there's also an interesting uh, variable message sign element on the signage. So the city uses that for other types of information. Uh, whatever you might want to convey to, the, to your visitors or your citizens, something other than parking, and they found that a very useful feature. Also in uh, San Jose, there's Santana Row, a large shopping center. We've uh, tied together many, uh, it says two garages, three surface lots, large signage around town. There's an example of our ultrasonic sensor that's uh, detecting vehicles as they come in and out of the, of the garage. Uh, example of the signage that's there telling people where spaces are available. Um, again, a variable message element. Uh, finally, Naperville, Illinois, interesting city because what they've done, whoop, wrong way, is that they have the parking information on the city website. So folks can go to the city website, be assured that there is parking there before they head downtown, and this is all up-to-date information. Okay, finally here, um, a lot of park and rides. So these are new, two new garages in the uh, for uh, Oak, uh, Go Transit, uh, Bart's uh, uh, sister, uh, 
uh, agency, say, in, in Toronto, where we are putting our system in um, two of ten planned garages now so people know before they get to the parking lot that there's going to be parking available for them. And some of the, the signage that's there on the outside. And you can see it's written in that other language that they have up in, uh, in Canada, French. So happy to talk to you about our technology and how we might be able to help you. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Yeah, I love you.